So we're going to talk about, uh, I'll, I'll, with predation and food webs, I'm going to lump detri eating detritus dead organisms as well as um, live organisms and omnivory. So the idea of spreading out where you eat on the food web. Talk about, as we did with the microbes, we talked about how predators do their job and then how the prey adapts to, the, to that, same thing. Non-lethal effects, uh, because predators don't always kill their prey. And we'll talk about then food webs, food chains. And I promised you when we talked about eutrophication that I talk about how you can control primary production by altering the food web, so I'm gonna get back to that. And then go into some of the theoretical community ecology and aquatic food webs, because aquatic systems have sort of form the basis of parts of our understandings of how com uh, community, complex community interactions occur. So this is a food web, um, a typical food web from a stream, and we have at the base of the food web the sources of energy, and this might be leaf litter, um, detritus, and biofilms, so diatoms growing on rocks, fungi, filamentous algae, and each of these different species will specialize on one or several things. So for example, leaf litter, we have all these organisms over here that, that tend to specialize on leaf litter, um, and they would be one of, um, called, the functional group would be shredders. Uh, we have others uh, that specialize on, on uh, algae to some degree, but what you can see, really see here, is that many of the organisms special, uh, don't specialize much, that is they eat a lot of different things. That's one of the hallmarks of streams in general, but many aquatic organisms is that they're omnivorous, and they'll eat the best food that they can get when they can get it, but if that's gone, they'll, they'll eat lower quality food. So that might be, you can scrape off these nice diatoms here, but uh, you know, if you get really hungry, then you can eat the leaf litter and the fungi that are associated with them. And then the other part of omnivory has to do with eating at different levels of the food web. Um, that that is, so so you can think of either a food web or a food chain, right? The idea of trophic levels, primary producers, primary consumers, secondary consumers, right? Or a net of interactions, and you you can see that some of these these organisms here at the very top actually have pathways that go all the way down to the fungi. So even these big bad predators on the top that are eating almost everybody else are also eating, um, are also able to eat uh, detritus and algae and stuff like that. So one of the questions that we're going to get to is how do you actually figure out what's going on in the, in the system? And one of the modern techniques to do that is to use isotopes and stable isotopes for to, to trace food webs. One of the real problems that we have when we have an organism, you collect it out of the environment, let's say we get a fish and we want to know what it has been eating. Okay, so that's fairly easy because you can go and, and evacuate the gut or if you kill the animal, just open the gut and look at what's inside of its gut. But what it's eating is not necessarily what's giving it the energy. So an example of this might be the trout that you find um, in the Gallatin River during the times of the summer when there's massive Clodophora blooms. If you go open their stomach up, they have lots of green, filamentous green algae in it. But if you look through their gut, it's pretty clear that it's not being broken down at all. So apparently what's happening is that they're basically eating this stuff to get the invertebrates that are in it. So we can think about predators and what they eat in terms of ingestion, but what's the term for what they turn into body tissue and take from their digestive systems into their body to make part of them? Some of you might have remembered this from, from uh, assimilation. fishing culture. Assimilation, great. Yeah, so the, so the idea, you, you, have, you have ingestion, you have assimilation, and you have excretion. And so obviously, you, you have to be able to sum excretion 
and assimilation and get ingestion, right? Because you got to got to get that stuff from somewhere. So the trick is figuring out what organisms are assimilating. And you can go through uh, the, uh, a fairly time demanding thing is that you can get an organism out of the natural habitat and you can feed it leaves and see how much it grows on leaves, how much it, how much it ingests, how much it grows, how much it excretes back out again. And if it's <coughs> like, a, like crayfish or something. It could eat leaves, it can eat filaments of salad. Then you gotta put filaments of salad in there to see how much it does. And then you gotta put invertebrates in there to see how much it does. And, and that's very time consuming, right? People don't necessarily, are not able to go out and find every organism out there and do that kind of experiment with them. So an alternative is to use stable isotopes because you are essentially, you are what you eat. And there are there are isotopes of many elements that are essential to the, to the bodies of organisms. The most commonly used are carbon-13 and carbon-12, and nitrogen-15 and nitrogen-14. So these, N14 and C12, are extraordinarily abundant, and these occur at trace levels, but they can be used, the ratio of those varies depending upon what's happening in the natural environment and where their sources are and where they are in the food web. And one of the neat things that happens is that organisms, as you move up the food web, they differentially retain N15. And so you get organisms with higher and higher content of N15 to N14. So you can use the N15 to N14 ratio once you get what the base levels are as an indicator of how high up an organism is eating in the food web. So we go back to think about that food web that I gave you, and, and there were animals that were predators, but they were eating primary consumers, secondary consumers, and maybe even you know, some leaf litter or something like that. You can figure out sort of wh wh what proportion of their diet is based on which of those things by how enriched it becomes in the sand 15. <laughs> so functionally, how, how you analyze these is you use a mass spectrometer and it's just, it just basically breaks it down to the individual elements, shoots them off through a magnetic field and, 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 and it's a charge, they put them in a charged form, it shoots them off through, through a magnetic field and it changes their pathway, right? The magnetic field causes them to veer off towards the, be attracted towards the negative charge if they're positive, for example. And the heavier it is, the less it veers. So nitrogen-15 is a little bit heavier than nitrogen-14, so the nitrogen-14 goes like that, and nitrogen-15 goes like that. And if you have a detector over here, you, get, you can differentiate how much of those two are in there relatively. So you take this stuff, you grind it up, you dry it, and you put it in the machine, and it gives you back these numbers. And so there's two food webs given here. Um, the first one is uh, stable isotopes from Lookout Creek in Oregon. And by the way, just to link back to the last last um, last lecture, that's I did work on the nostoc that were in there. And for some strange reason, they didn't put the nostoc in this food web. But go yeah, we'll figure. And then the other one is one of these high Arctic lakes, Tulik Lakes, uh, up on the north slope of Alaska, near the um, Anwar, the National Wildlife Refuge up there. And so we go along this x-axis, which is the the carbon signal, signal, and the N15 axis, the nitrogen signal. And we see the, the food sources that they could get are down here, that there's tree leaves, fine particles, and periphyton. And then the primary consumers, as you can see, are about two or three daily units higher than their potential food sources as predicted. But there is something in here that suggests that we're missing something. What is that? Something on that graph that suggests we're missing a food source. And a key piece of information here is that I told, I actually, I think I mentioned that the carbon, you're pretty much, you are what you eat in isotopes. The nitrogen fractionates, but the carbon doesn't seem to fractionate as much. 
So, so what's what what are we missing here when I look at this? Why am I what if I look at this? I say, okay, I'm missing a food source. What? Why do I say that? Is it because predators and primates and similes have similar carbon? Right, so we're probably pretty good here on the predators and primary consumers. So these animals are eating these animals. Not only do we probably know that from gut contents, but also there's that three del unit difference and the carbon is lining up, but the nitrogen has that difference of about three units. But over here, right, what's, what, if I go down to carbon here, it means I'm missing a food source of carbon that's sitting over here somewhere for the primary consumers. So you can analyze these and, and, and see that, that kind of thing. Carbon's a little bit difficult with periphyton in particular because diffusion rates actually cause fractionation of that carbon. So it turns out, depending upon how fast the water's flowing, you can have different levels of carbon uh, 12, uh, carbon 13 in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the algae. So they could just be picking out some algae that are in fast water as opposed to slow water, something like that. Okay, so the next one we can think about here is, um, is this tulip lake one, and we have the periphyton, the phytoplankton, and then Carex is, is a, a aquatic macrophyte. And it looks like we have almost the exact same problem here, right? Because the copepod that we would think would be eating the phytoplankton is sitting over here on the carbon scale. So you can look at this and say, okay, we need to go out and sample more and get some food, get, get a different food. Um, and it's possible that this is, we've missed some of the food sources of the fish, that the fish are probably eating something in addition to the copepods. So in this example, I would sort of hypothesize, look, the phytoplankton are there, maybe it's, there's another one that we're missing, or maybe they're picking some invertebrates from the benthic areas and the shallow areas where there's a periphyton, and it's just pulling them back over this way this type of food source here. So in an ideal web, you would have like everything, like at least on the carbon scale kind of line, you'd have something that overlapped a little bit each time or? Well, you would have, a, you'd basically, you assume there's a mixing and you'd have the, that, if you knew what their food sources was, were. So for example, if we had, had this primary consumer here, you can say that there should be another source over here. Now, there could be a source a little way over here that they eat a whole lot of, right? So that sort of drags them a little bit this way. Or there could be a food source with carbon signal way over here that they eat a little bit of and it drags them over there. So the, they become what they eat. That is the proportion of the isotope in their body reflects how what the signal is here, and then how what the proportion of that their diet is made up of, their assimilated diet is made up of. All right, so the ideal thing is then to go out and, and measure things like gut contents on these guys and these guys, and to get an idea of what you're missing, and then go then try to try to go out back and resample. All right. How do you find like the nitrogen percentage or carbon percentage in, in all of those organisms? Like, how do you how do you calculate that? The del the this yeah the, 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 this is a parts per thousand C thirteen. So you just take like a C12. tissue sample or something? Or? Yeah, basically. I mean, you go out and you scrape periphyton off a rock and then you dry it and grind it up and weigh it and put it in these little tin boats and send it off to the machine and, and they analyze it. It's pretty. Pretty straightforward. Actually, it's one of the easier sample preps there is out there to do. Is it easy still to do it with the small organisms like copepods? No, that's a trick. Um, and this guy Brian Fry has got his machines tuned. <coughs> so um, this is this fellow here. He's a he's a mad scientist, but he's got his machine tuned so you can get by a few copepods. Otherwise, you, know, you need a couple of milligrams, and you, you're picking copepods for a long, long time. So that's, yeah, that's a good question. So with fish, it's easy to pull muscle tissue out or something like that, and it's straightforward. The other thing you can do with these is actually with organisms that move around a lot, you can figure out if their isotopes are specific to where 
they're where they are in the habitat. So there's like migratory birds, you can trace where they came from by doing isotopic analysis of, of, of their feathers or something non-destructive and then get an idea of where, where they actually where they actually came from. So that's another, that's another interesting use of it, not necessarily related to the food webs. There's a lot of different ways you can use it. So one of the projects that I've been involved with is called Lodic Intersite Nitrogen Experiment. And rather than use what, this is what's called the natural abundance, we have this variation naturally in the system. But we can also buy nitrogen that is very enriched in the <coughs> And we went out to the streams in Kanza and actually added N15 for five weeks and watched it move through the food web. And once you, when you put that perturbation in, then you can model the rates of flux between each of the compartments and get a very specific ecosystem um, rates. And, and that, so that, so it's, you can use them as tracers in addition. It's, it's a n nice technique that's been available. I didn't see any of you there, but we had a student uh, that was talking yesterday who wanted to see the effects of mussels in the rivers in Oklahoma. And she fed juvenile mussels algae that had a ton of N15 in them for, I think, a year, she said? She fed, she fed them for a year, so these mussels had like 50 del units of nitrogen in them. And then she plumped them down in the river and she measured the N15 and all the algae and the invertebrates and watched that N15 get, get pushed up higher and higher as, the, as they excreted their nitrogen out into the environment and, and the other organisms took it up. So it's a real nice tr tracer that can be used as well to get at food webs. <coughs> Her bottom line was 10, 20% of the nitrogen in these systems is, is fluxing through, these, th through the mussels and the rivers. She couldn't have figured, she couldn't have nailed that down without using the isotopes and the tracers. So.